Thanks so much for being here. I'm Sarah Campbell. I'm the executive director of Portland Public Library. And uh, we're just so glad to have this turnout today and this opportunity to uh, have a conversation with Ethan Strimling and Abdi Norvton, who uh, are our special guests today. Um, just wanted to take a minute to say, I, I don't know whether, is it better close or farther, farther away? OK. Can you hear me? OK. In between. Um, OK. Uh, first off, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that this is uh, part of our literary lunches. And we have uh, some flyers at the back that uh, have some of our upcoming literary lunches on them. These are very exciting. We do them all as dialogues now, which has uh, turned out to be a really great format. Um, also, we have a special spotlight series. And uh, we have one tomorrow evening. Uh, Thursday evening with Rick Russo, Richard Russo, and Monica Wood having a conversation together. So I hope that you'll consider coming back and joining us for that. Uh, two very strong local favorites. Um, for the Literary Lunch Series, we have fantastic partners. And I ask you to uh, join me in thanking Coffee by Design for providing our refreshments. And our longtime partner, Longfellow Books, uh, right across the square, who have books here. Uh, so huge thank you to Ari. <laughs> Ari has books, uh, has Abdi's book here for sale. And Abdi will be staying after to sign copies uh, and to have a chance to meet you. And we're especially grateful to Longfellow because uh, you share 10% of the of the cost of the book with the library as a donation and part of our partnership. 20? Today it's 20! <laughs> uh, 30? <laughs> no, we, we want Longfellow books to be good and strong. So, um, well, this is a particularly important uh, conversation today, uh, certainly very timely as we in Portland strive to be a safe, welcoming, uh, and very productive, uh, diverse city. And so we're thrilled to have the opportunity to talk uh, so closely with, uh, with Abdi and Ethan. Um, just want to introduce Ethan, although he may need very little introduction. Um, he is the current mayor of Portland, and he was a former state senator for six years. Uh, and we're especially glad to have Ethan having this conversation with Abdi because of all of his work uh, directly supporting the experience of the immigrant and refugee population here in, the, in Maine and the greater Portland area. Prior to becoming mayor, Ethan was CEO of Learning Works, which is a nonprofit organization that provides opportunities for the immigrant and refugee community and other underserved communities, uh, at risk youth and low income families. And uh, the mayor has also supported a number of endeavors to uh, build integration and uh, to, uh, to uh, bring the, our immigrant and refugee neighbors into the political life in our city. Uh, so just briefly, oh, yes, here, and here is Ethan Strimling. <laughs> and just quickly, Abdi Norifton uh, arrived in Portland, and here's Abdi. Arrived in Portland in August of 2014 from the, a refugee life in Kenya. And as he describes it, he became a permanent resident and not a refugee anymore. Abdi, yeah. <laughs> Abdi works as an interpreter for the Somali community who have my, immigrated to the state. And he was accepted to the University of Southern Maine, where he will soon be studying political science. So. Abdi, welcome. Ethan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks very much for having us and for hosting this event today. Uh, this is, a, I hope, to be a very uh, informative conversation, but also informal, and hopefully uh, you and I will get to know each other a little better, but most importantly, I hope everyone here gets to know you uh, quite a bit more, and I hope you all buy his book before you leave. Uh, I think it's really important to support uh, the kinds of efforts. It's a beautiful book. I, I will say up front, I didn't get all the way through it, uh, but I've read uh, most of it, and it's uh, beautifully written and uh, just tells a remarkable story. So thank I you very it's much. It's not going to be boring. <laughs> it will not be boring. You'll be hanging on the edge of your seat for quite a bit of it. Um, so I, I want to dive in. We'll get to the book a little bit, but I think it's important to sort of talk a little bit about some current events that have been happening. Uh, yesterday, the Supreme Court upheld a uh, travel ban that the President Trump had put into place. You had some very strong statements about that. I think it's very related to the book that you wrote. Your statement uh, was, uh, the White House betrayed uh, my American dream and makes me feel the America, uh, feel that America is no longer the exceptional nation for everyone. Very strong statement, and I'm wondering uh, if you'd be willing to elaborate on that a little bit, why you made the statement and how you feel about it. So um, I, can, I can elaborate that sentence that the mayor has just read. Um, so um, in, the, in the eyes of millions of people out there that are not in the United States, what makes America great is the exceptionalism of America, the reception of America, the democracy, the tolerance, the freedom um, that America provides and the opportunities. And I will tell you why these things that I just mentioned, uh, which are great characteristics of America, had saved my life. So I grew up in a war zone where you're just surrounded by destruction and malicious and everything else, but somehow watching American films, American movies, actually, gave me some hope where like, I realized, you know, out there, there's a life, even though you know it's a movie, but somehow you realize that this connects you to a life that is not exactly what's happening in Somalia. So at this point, I re, um, um, uh, re, recreated uh, myself from the guy who was running all over the place, bare feet, hungry, into an American. And I asked my friends um, at, at that age, uh, you know, to call me American. So at this point, the, the feeling that I had in my heart that one day, I wasn't quite sure 100% if it would ever happen, but I convinced myself one day I would be able to move out to the land of the free. And then what happened? I have, in, because of this feeling that I had, because of this inspiration that went into my heart, got me completely not do what was going on in the city. Because there was a child soldier, you know, people were uh, recruited into the army. And then by 2006, a group of Islamists has come all over the place and they have been demonizing America. So, to go back to the question, this is a gift, a really good gift, and it makes the, uh, the groups like ISIS and Qaeda, or Taliban, or Al-Shabaab, which is in Somalia, it makes them so happy to hear this administration doing with what it's doing. And it just shows them wherever they are, you know, in Syria, and Somalia, and Yemen, it shows the communities that they are oppressing to say like, this is what I told you. America is a hostile place. It's an enemy. And you see that today. The President of the United States is saying this, and somehow they're trying to um, convince that this is not a, 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 a ban on anything else but a Muslim. So the image, it, it weakens the image of America. It strengthens the image of America's enemy. That's why I'm saying, this is a betrayal to my American dream. Because the America that I moved to was the America that I wanted to find a shelter, peace, and prosperity away from uh, recruitment into this uh, type of group. And now what, what this, uh, the White House is doing today is completely counter to what I've always believed. They're just trying to encourage um, and kill the hearts and hopes and dreams of those young generations that are living out there 
exactly through uh, going through the same things that I was that I was going through. They probably have dreams. They probably are watching movies as we speak now. But unfortunately, they don't believe that they're going to be coming to the U.S. because of the ban. And what else? What other options do they have? So this is an opportunity for for ISIS or Al Shabaab or Boko Haram to go around and say, "Look, you don't have any other option. So you're stuck with us. So you you know you need to be part of us." So that's my reaction to the travel ban. It's not going to make America great again. It weakens America's image. Backstage, when we were talking just before we came out, you mentioned that a lot of people that you're working with in the Somali community, that many are actually now going back to Somalia, choosing that that life is perhaps better than the life that they experienced in coming to the United States or coming to Maine. Uh, do you think that this travel ban is adding to that feeling that people want to go back to your home country, or uh, is there something greater? Can you walk us through a little bit about why you think people now are actually making the choice to go home as opposed to staying here and making this their future? Uh, so the, the, the people are, are tired and exhausted from, um, I was telling the mayor a few minutes ago, I interpret for someone who had been in the U.S. for 20 years, and I was here three years and 10 months, and, and somehow my, my English is from the movies. Right. Well, thanks to commandos and terminators, you know, uh, I would, and, uh, and I'm going to ask you about that in okay. a minute because I want to understand. Perfect. Not many people say they watch Schwarzenegger movies and that makes them want to go to America. So I'm going right. to, I want to ask a little bit about that. But first, tell us why people are going back. So. Well, they say I sound better than Aaron Schwarzenegger, which is good. <laughs> you do. Um, so people are moving out mostly because in the first place, they came to the United States seeking peace and stability. So somehow they have been here, even though they become citizens 20 years is a long time, or have green cards, but people have been here temporarily. They didn't believe that here's home. And the reason for that is the fear, uh, and I want to teach you a little bit about Somalia. Somalia is a homogenous community, one language, one culture, we all look alike. <laughs> so, so in this case, um, even throughout the civil war, people are smiling, they're dressing, they're just going to places as long as you can afford uh, something to eat. So what people are doing today is they have been in the U.S. for 20 years. It doesn't matter if you clean hotels or walk at Walmart or graduated from college, they put together some money and they're able to go back in the safer areas of Somalia. And Somalia has, uh, it's a semi-desert, semi it's dry. But specifically in the north, People are moving back there because it, somehow it doesn't have a lot of present, presence of, uh, of Al-Shabaab. But in this case, the ordinary people that live in the, environment, in the area are tired of the war. And they're looking for uh, something better. You know, they're not interested in, in the war anymore. And they have, they have been seeing this for 27 years as we speak. So people are moving back, realizing that um, the life here is going to continue and Somalia is not changing. So somehow they believe that they can be part of the change. So what they're doing is they're investing their money, flying back home and building structures. You know, some, uh, I know some people who built uh, hospitals and you can, you can do that with $3,000, which is not a lot if you work uh, several hours in, in the United States for several months. So you can put together that money and then move it back and somehow they're just investing you know, that money and, and helping the communities that are in there. I agree at some point, and again, I disagree, because if you see me, I'm not really here temporarily. <laughs> I moved to the U.S. on a flight one night. For those of you who heard this American Life piece, um, how many people heard that piece? Oh, wow, that's a good number. Okay, so there was a piece on This American Life, a, uh, a podcast called Abdi and the Golden Ticket. When I left Somalia, I said, I'm not going to come back. And then I left Kenya as a refugee, and I said, I'm not going to come back. And I came to the U.S., and I said, I'm not going nowhere. <laughs> so with this election and whatever happened now, and people, Americans saying, I'm going to move to Canada, you know, I just give them this funny look. It's like, it's up to you. I'm not crossing into any border. So I'm here. Um, and he's not the king. He's going to be leaving soon. So, um, 
to, so that's, that's why I think people are moving back somehow, and it's also related to the kids. You have kids here in American schools, they only teach one language, which is English. So somehow, the kids are growing up in this environment where assimilation is a word that people don't like. Actually, who agrees with me? Most immigrant communities agree with me. Assimilation actually means leaving behind your heritage and everything else and completely melting into, into America and becoming an American. So look at all these white people. Your grandfathers are, if you go back like three generations, where did they come from? Scotland, other places, and now you have an American accent? And who are you? You're an American. So somehow today's immigrants don't really want to go through that. We're living in, a, in an age where flights are easy, you can leave from here 20 hours, you're in Africa. So people want to connect, stay connected to their countries, and specifically a country like Somalia, which if you look 27 years of war, it seems like we're, we're going to the same ro route of Palestine. If you look at the map today, you're not gonna see Palestine at all. So we're somehow going that way, where we feel like Ethiopia is pushing its borders towards us, Kenya is pushing its borders towards us, and we have the largest sea uh, coastline, and people are coming fishing and dumping their stuff in there, and then what's gonna happen? So it, it creates some fear in the people. And me, thinking about this, situ you know, this kind of thing, I'm like, well, I can do something, so I can be the two of them. So I'm, I was thinking a word called salad instead of melting pot. <laughs> you know, the melting pot, like, where you melt, but then the salad, it has all the ingredients, the tomato and cucumber and all of these things, and then the dressing, and what happens? It's delicious. Mm. I like that. Yeah, I, I, w I think actually that what has made America as great as it is, is that the immigrants in the past have actually not given up their own uh, identity, still very connected to who they are, and that they make our culture stronger and deeper. Uh, it, I think it has built what has made uh, the parts of America that are great, is that people don't melt, that they become the salad. So thank you for that imagery. So. So let's get to the book a little bit. Um, I listened to a bunch of the interviews that people had. Everybody always asks, and I feel like I should ask it here because I think your response has been um, really important for people to recognize. Why did you write the book? Uh, what, is the, um, what, what started you down that path? Uh, Toni Morrison famously has said, uh, when somebody asked her why did you write uh, your first book, she said, I wrote it because I wanted to read it. And that, I needed to see it so I could read it, and that was her way of communicating whatever it was, and she was happy that others wanted to share in that story as well. So I guess I would ask you, why did you write this book? Uh, in America, you have thousands of authors, yes. thousands of books, and American, like in Maine only, there's like hundreds of authors, like everyone wrote a book. But if, in, my, in my community, in the immigrant community, I'm so, honored to be part of the few, the minority people who thought of putting the, the stories that they have into words so that other people can read. And this is something that could help other than me going all over the place and talking to people. So that's what, I've, what I did before I wrote the book. I, got, um, um, I was on the radio, I did uh, citizen journalism, when I was in Mogadishu, I talked to NPR, and I realized that people have so much, um, they're craving for, uh, for more. They, they want to hear more. And the day that I decided to write this book was uh, when this American Life episode went on air, and I received thousands of messages from everywhere saying like, this was amazing. And then I said, that's only a little bit of the story. <laughs> um, I know some of you guys are asking why call me American. I'm not American yet, right? I'm, I'm a, uh, this uh, funny immigrant guy who just came in and waiting for another year to become, to become a citizen. But let me tell you this. Um, today, as we speak, the, take a moment and think about this. What does it feel like to become a combination of a Somali, a Muslim, an immigrant, a refugee, a diversity visa lottery winner? a person of color. These are the scary things that you can hear on the media today, uh, especially with, with the White House that we have and the, the Europeans uh, pushing back immigrants. So I am a combination of six things that I just mentioned. Um, and my book's not called Call Me Somali. 
it, it's not called call me immigrant. It's not called call me, um, call me a refugee or diversity lottery winner. This um, is a, a book of a fundamental human desire for freedom, independence, and most importantly, safety and peace. So if you, if you read this book, you will, you will realize why what they're saying today against immigrants that um, you know, the moving population of today from everywhere, uh, except the US and Canada, everyone else is you know, on the move, except some countries in Europe. We are not rabies, we're not um, insects, infestations, uh, what did he call us, so many things. Um, you realize the humanity and the desire that we have for countries like the United States, which in, uh, in our eyes is an exceptional place where, you know, uh, if we go through risks and determination, we're gonna be able to make the dream come true. That's exactly my story. And that's why I wrote this book, to just explain that we're not here to steal or to take anything from the US government. I will tell you this, I came to the country as a diversity winner not as a refugee, which is a funny thing. That's a, that's a fight. I fought so hard because I couldn't come to the U.S. As a, as, a, as, a, you know, as a refugee. I wasn't allowed to. The government, the United States Embassy was not calling me for an interview, and they were not doing it. They only bring in 9% of the entire 25 million refugees out there. And then the rest of the, like, over 90% of these refugees are living in the neighboring countries like uh, middle class or low income countries like Kenya. So what did I do? I applied for the lottery, and somehow the U.S. State Department were just wondering who the hell is this guy? You know, this refugee plays a green card lottery and he wins, and what are we supposed to do with this guy? You know, and this is a time when Somalia was under the um, countries of terrorism. The U.S. has considered anyone who comes out of that place has a red flag on them. Specifically, if you're a young man and have no wife and no kids, and I had a heart, but my physical appearance looked like to them as a terrorist, as an al-Shabaab. Because if you look at the uh, seven or eight Somalis who attacked the mall in Kenya, and the uh, cameras called them, they all look like us. You know, when I was growing up as a child, I thought that all Americans look alike. <laughs> but they probably have the same feeling. But um, I just wrote this book as a response to say that you were wrong to just wonder who I was. This is who I am. I am an American. Because you, yeah. You don't, you don't have to, to be born in the US to be American. You can be American anywhere. And what, is, what does that mean to you, being an American? Uh, so, it can mean many things, but to me, to be American means to be, um, someone who has an identity. Do you know that refugees don't have identity? Seriously, we don't. I mean, I'm a Somali, I don't have a birth certificate. So when the refugees, they all put down January 1 for all of us because we don't have identity with us. A refugee ID is not something that you can get on a flight and go somewhere. A Somali passport doesn't exist. So I grew up in this environment. So to me, it's an identity. I, uh, that's what America means to me. I came in, landed in Logan Airport, and I was wondering if the gravitation felt the same, but it looked the same, like Africa, you know. Um, and uh, they took my fingerprints, and a week later, my green card had arrived in the house, and you can't imagine, my sponsoring family is here tonight. I was running all over the place. You know, felt like, Ray, nobody's gonna do anything to me right now. Even though that had changed lately, but that was the feeling I had. So do you not feel, and by the way, I didn't know your family is here, where are they? Here are and Natalia. Oh, great. Thank you very much for all you've done. Um, uh, so do you not consider yourself Somali, or how does that part of your identity uh, still, uh, still be part of it? How is that still part of you? That's a very good question. My friends argue with me, and I still have my childish attitude. When I was so young, I denied Somali. I denied the tribes and everything else, and I called myself American. So um, no. I, um, I am Somali, and I have not abandoned Somalia, not at all, because part of me is still in Somalia. 
uh, my mother is there, my sister, she has kids, and I'm financially responsible for doing that. Um, I can't go back at all. It's dangerous. Um, and they're living in, in, in a war zone. Um, and there's, I mean, um, so I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but this is the feeling that I have for now um, with through all the uh, difficult life that I have had in the past. So to me, it's like a relaxation period now where like, I just wanna tell myself I'm American and that's something important to mention first because I can't say I'm not American, I'm Somali. I can't say I'm not Somali, I'm American. I can be both. So that's where I am right now. Can you, um, and just uh, from a process, so everybody knows, uh, we'll, I'll ask a few more questions for the next oh, 10 minutes or so, and then we want to open it up to you. So if you have questions, give you an opportunity to ask uh, Abdi directly what it is that um, you may have. Um, you talk a little bit, uh, obviously not just a little bit, but quite a bit in the book, sort of, um, can you talk about uh, the moment of arrival and getting here and the expectation of what you expected to feel and how the reality of what you felt met that expectation. And then I want to talk about a few years later how you're feeling about that expectation versus what you're feeling. But at the moment, I'd just like people to hear a little bit about the moment after the incredible journey you had to go through in which you were clearly focused on this is where you wanted to be and you arrived. Can you talk a little bit about what that, what that was like? I arrived in uh, late 2014. And the uh, it was August 11, the, the, the evening that I landed. And that, that evening, um, a, a young black man was, was killed by, by a white officer, I think, in Missouri, and his name was uh, Michael Brown. And I was, I was in the terminal at the airport, and it was all over the breaking news. And uh, um, it was an introduction to America, to me. Welcome to the United States. And on top of that, the, you know, when you, when you come to, to, to the country, they ask you to, uh, to mention if you are a Caucasian or Asian or Latino or black and African, like slash African, that kind of thing. So they, they gave me that form to fill, and I was standing there for 15 minutes wondering who I was. And, uh, and then someone helped me, and they said, well, you're black or African American. So I ticked that. So what does that show you? I've never identified myself my immigrant friends can share that as well. But where we come from, we could identify ourselves as either tribes or ethnicity or something like that, but not the skin color that we have. So that was another surprise to me. It was like, I thought Eddie Murphy and, uh, you know, and Denzel Washington were like uh, everybody else, you know, Tom Cruise or Bruce Willis. I mean, they're not different. That's the feeling that you have when you watch the movies. And that's the feeling, the feeling that I had when I came to the US and I'm like, you can be anybody else, you know, you can be side by side with this person and you don't have, you know, to mention your thing. Uh, but I realized that's not the reality. And um, funny thing, I ended up in Maine, one of the whitest states in the country. <laughs> I ended up in Yarmouth specifically. I haven't seen any diversity in the area. So uh, walking around, you know, on the thing and I found this insulation job that I was doing and you know, you look rough and all that stuff. And, you know, just walking around. So we had to tell everyone, don't call 911 on this guy. He's, he's with us, you know. <laughs> he's, he's, in the, he's in the area. Um, and then um, people got to know me, and so nothing had happened. But that was actually, to me, the shock of America. Where, like, where are these skyscrapers? Where's the madness? Where's the police chasing the tax? You don't see that movement that you see in the movies. You see this quietness and a little bit of privacy. But I didn't give up. Now I eat apple pies, steaks, burgers, American food, and I eat our traditional meal. Um, and uh, the good thing about America is that like, you can go to any restaurant. Um, so it's, it's, it's a mix of both, like how America has introduced me to some African nations that I would never meet. Like I haven't met a Congolese and Nigerian in Somalia in my entire life, I haven't seen them. So to me it was a surprise to be in the line behind this guy at Boston when I landed and I, I thought he was African-American at some point, and he just gave me this African accent. I'm from Nigeria, and I said, oh, wow, great. Nice to see you. And then we talked a little bit. So, yeah, it's actually, America is, is multi, more than multicultural than I thought. If you ever come to Back Cove, where we play soccer, 
you can see at least 15 languages being spoken all over the place. And uh, people communicate in their native language, and we hang out, we play, and it's a tough game, but then at the end of the day, it's a handshake, you know, and saying, all right, have a good evening, and then next day, we come together. So somehow, I found an identity of America, but a multicultural America, and the America that gives me some wonderful friends, uh, friends that do not accept me only because of the sameness of believing in what they believe, but America that's interested in the difference that I have. People ask questions, like, what is it like? What do you eat? What's your music like? What's the mosque like? So I, I was really surprised in that part of America where like the white people that were born in Maine are so much interested in knowing about my culture and my music and my life in the past. So somehow that gave me uh, a funny feeling where like, okay, wow, great, you know, people are so much open to this. And then there's the other part was like the, this tribe I worked with, the insulation, who call their wives all the ladies, um, <laughs> who can't say lobster, they say lobster. I mean, I'm not trying to say anything about the main accent, but this was, this was a tribe that I worked with and I was, I was the odd one out, like sitting in the truck and it's cold outside and they're smoking inside and I was like wondering what's going on. You know, and I told the boss, can you send me to work with uh, someone who's not doing anything that they're doing? And he said, well, you're the only one, you know? And so that was another America to me, how some America is actually uneducated, doing drags and being arrested and missing some teeth and have tattoos all over their place, their bodies. That was, yeah, that was actually um, um, something else. It, you know, just reminded me how uh, I have to explain Africa itself, even though I don't, I'm not an expert in Africa because I've never been out of Eastern Africa. I've never gone in the, in the, you know, in the central or anywhere else. But then they ask me like, you know, how the monkeys or how the elephants. And, <laughs> And somehow I have to say, like, you know, I grew up in the Civil War, so I haven't seen any elephants at all. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. And so tell us, share with us a little bit about how America has met what you expected it to be and the ways that it has failed in meeting what you expected it. Growing up, you had this, we don't shoot people up out of helicopters the way Schwarzenegger does most of the time. Uh, but, you know, you really had this dream to be here, very young, nickname, all of that and you got here, and now you've been here for a while. Can you reflect for us a little bit on both how we have met, what it is that you were hoping for, what you expected to feel, that freedom, and in the ways that perhaps we have come up short? I have a chapter in the book called English to Arab, uh, Arabic to English, <laughs> which is the funny part. My mom wanted me to be a sheikh, uh, someone who grows the bird and, and wears the Islamic dress and becomes a permanent mosque goer and uh, someone who's dedicated uh, because that was at the time the fashion in Mogadishu because people believed that we're in the civil war because God was angry with us. So my mom was part of the community that believed the same thing. She said, oh, in the 80s and 70s, we had nightclubs, music, and white people in bikinis running all over the place. So I think God is angry with us for that to happen. Now we need to reconstruct our identity so that peace can come. And she always prayed for an Islamic state which actually eventually her prayer was answered and it became Al-Shabaab. But what did I do? I protested. I said, mom, nope, that's not the way I'm going. I see something else. So I taught myself English by watching all these movies and I believed that um, America is the answer to, to my desperation at the time. <laughs> uh, some things have changed. America is, uh, you know, can, does not have this, the feeling that I had at some point, you know, where like if, if you're not here, if, if you are somewhere else and you have never been to the U.S., the feeling of the word in Somali called bofis, which is a, a longing, a need, a desperate need to get to America and just have an ice cream. <laughs> it, it's, it's just heaven. That's it. You don't need to go to school. Just stay there and have ice cream. I, had, I went to Ben and Jerry's a lot. Um, <laughs> Uh, this place called uh, Giffords in Yarmouth and many other places, and I, ha I had their ice cream, and now I feel like, you know, I have had enough, so let me take a break. You know, I, so, so there's, there's a little bit of fatigue that I feel from the energy that I had as young. <laughs> uh, but then there's the other America that I got in myself into, which is like, look ahead of you, look to the future. 
What are you going to start at college? And what do you want to do? And then there's all these opportunities that I wake up every morning thinking, I'm going to do something. But I don't remember one day in Somalia or Kenya where I woke up thinking, I'm going to do something. I, you know, I was like, the cops are going to come today and they will take you. That was the feeling in Kenya. And in Somalia, it's like, you're not going to come back home. A bullet is going to go through your head or an explosion or a roadside bomb. But the, the feeling here, sometimes, I actually, honestly, I, I say thanks to God every morning when I wake up, feel like, wow, you know, nobody's out there who's going to point their gun points at my head. Nobody's going to blow me up. So I have some sort of, you know, waking up uh, and have plans. You go to work or you go to meeting or you go hang out with friends at the coffee. And isn't that something amazing? No, it's, it's few things that you take for granted. The few things that American, it's a privilege that so many Americans take for granted. But to us, you, you might find me walking around, going to the coffee, and I just enjoy that uh, one minute of walk, you know? It, it just feels wonderful that uh, you're not coming after me, um, you're not telling me what to do, and that's America, you know? You can do anything that you want. So that's, that's, that's the ways that we've come up short in what you expected us to be. Uh, yes. Um, I, I, I never expected an American president would disappoint me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a shock, isn't it? Trust, trust, you will read the book, but this is funny. Um, uh, Bush announces a war in Iraq, um, actually Afghanistan, and then it was Osama against Bush, and this was when I was practicing my English all over Mogadishu, because we didn't have the Islamic Revolution yet, and I was supporting Bush. I know, don't get me wrong, but I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. I don't know, he was a Republican. That is dangerous to admit in the city of Portland, but right, right. it'll be all right. Right, but to me, to me, it was just the, the feeling about everything in America, and uh, I, I read uh, The Art of the Deal. Yes, I read that, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I didn't know this guy was gonna be president. <laughs> I, I thought he was a wonderful American, trust me. I, you know, my brother and I, we would just like, he would take and read one page and I would read one page. And this is when we were stuck in Kenya in one room. And trust me, I was smiling. I thought everything in there was true. Turns out it's not. He didn't even write it. So that is another thing about America that's like, well, that's not true. It's not America, actually. It's not true what I felt. Did you have a ghostwriter for your book? Or did, was, what? did you have a ghostwriter for your book or did you actually write it? Uh, Max? <laughs> Max Alexander is here. So I, you. <laughs> I did. I wrote, I wrote the book. But I, I want to tell you the most difficult part of writing the book. I do the translation in my head. Like, you know, I, I'm thinking in my native language. I'm not there yet to think in English. So I've been thinking in my native, but the words became English. So I'm putting down, and at some point I read what I wrote, what I, you know, what I was trying to say in my head, and it seems like I'm not it's, it doesn't sound like what I did. So Max has been working with me to figure out that kind of feeling, but it's my words, it's an English, it's not my first language. So which is also a great accomplishment, actually. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. It is uh, beautiful prose. Uh, so we're gonna go to questions in one second, so uh, please uh, compile your question in your head. Last question before we get there. So your father played basketball, right? Bit of a basketball star, so I got to ask you: Are you basketball or soccer? Which I, one? I'm is not into basketball. Not into. I'm all right. into you, soccer. Are you? Uh, Who are you rooting for in the World Cup? Somalia is not there, so. Uh. Uh, I'm not rooting, rooting for any African nation, which is interesting. I'm with Brazil, and I've been huh? with them for a long time. You a Neymar fan? Is I, that the? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I was for Ronaldo fan first in 98, you know, okay. and, and then later years. But I still stick with them. It's like funny because I have no connection with Brazil. Um, it's another thing that introduces us to other people. I've never been to Brazil. I don't speak their language, Portuguese. But somehow, I feel that their team plays much better. So I'm sticking with them. All right. <laughs> All right. What well, are you rooting for, Mayor? I actually like Brazil. I'm a Neymar fan, too, but I love Messi. I mean, how can you not like okay, Messi? So Argentina. So, yeah, Argentina is awesome. So anyway, since the U.S. isn't there. All right, so why don't we turn it out to you, and if you have any questions about uh, either the book itself or if you have uh, any uh, general questions. I saw somebody in the back. We'll start with you who uh, raised your hand. So if you could come forward maybe a little bit and so people can hear you, that would be great. Hello. Hi, Abdi. Um, 
I know that Portland, Maine is a very welcoming community and we do so much for our immigrants, or we do quite a bit, but I was wondering both as an immigrant and an interpreter for Catholic Charities, um, what can we do more? What's the gap? What's the biggest gap you see in our support for refugee, asylum seeker, immigrant communities? Uh, I see, I, the thing I see is the disconnection. People are not really connected very well. Like if you look at the apartments where the immigrant communities are living, um, like let's say third floor and then there's a white family that lives on second floor and they're not saying hi to each other. So that's where we should begin to first try to get these people to talk to each other. And sometimes, uh, you know, when, when we have been through wars and all of that, easy things that Americans think are easy can, can be frightening and scary to us. Like it was just like me going to Dunkin' Donuts and trying to order something out of that menu and I was freaked out. <laughs> Even though I speak English, I was really freaked out. First, would they like, will they understand if I say hot chocolate? which turns out to be hot chocolate, you know? Things like that. So I think what we need and what I'm trying to do every day is don't be scared, just express yourself. Sometimes we may be a very conservative, uh, um, uh, restricted kind of culturally, um, but it, it, it does not hurt for the person to get connected to the other person. So that's what I feel that there's some sort of disconnection and the, the best way that we can connect them is to do um, Music events, for example, you know, where you can have this guy play the guitar and the other person can, can play the drums and say like, you know, we can actually mix this together and it sounds like, like I, I was talking about the salad. Um, main, I mean, Portland is, uh, is, is, is a pretty good, uh, era. like I, I was in Minnesota the other day and uh, it's what, it has the largest Somali, Somali area and I went to this place called Little Mogadishu and we were doing a recording because someone had a mic on my face and we had people approaching us, you know, just wondering what was going on. Um, and I, it was the, my first day, and you know, I, I, I was saying like, well, I don't know because I don't live here, but I'm, I'm here because I thought that the community is large here. And then everyone showed up and they started speaking English. And I tried to communicate in Somali and turned out most of the guys who were there were born in Minnesota and had, could not understand Somali. <laughs> So that's another thing, and the best way to do that is for the families to start um, some sort of, you know, getting the kids listen to music. I know so culturally sometimes it's not appropriate to listen to music, but I understand that it's, it can give you the words and the stories, of course, because we have wonderful music from Somalia in the 70s and 60s, and the stories they tell, because we're traditionally um, oral society, we speak. And then the way we speak, we turn that into a poem or a, sing, a song, and then we need to encourage that uh, in every community, that, you know, for, uh, uh, if, if you play your Nigerian music in your car and roll down the window, and driving on Congress Street, that's fine to me. You know, I love it, and nobody's gonna say anything. So I think that is what we are missing, the, the connection. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, over here in the back, and then we'll come to you. Yep, right here. Yep. Have you sent your book to the president? I don't know if we can read, we may have it. <laughs> Did I what? Have you sent your book to the president? Oh, to the president. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, I know, I wish I had his address. What's the, what's the address of the White House? Yeah. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's pretty easy, baby. You, you know what I should do? I would say I read... Um, I read his book, so you should read my book. Yeah. Yeah. I read the Art of the Deal. Yes. I bet writing books helps cut some red tape in America's culture more times. Uh, you keep saying you're American, so that uh, I ask you, uh, as a self-described American, do you see a problem about an American city mayor, even scribbling, empowering Muslim males in the arena of First Amendment freedom, and conversely, as everyone knows in town, disempowering 
certain boarding and Bible females in the First Amendment arena by doing things like favoritism based on religious category. In other words, I mean, do you think the American government should not discriminate on the basis of religion? Well, that's, uh, take the last part. You don't have to comment on her initial part about, uh, about first, me. First but. of all, I think the mayor is doing a wonderful job, beautiful job, and encouraging. And, and, um, the way I see things that he does, and I follow him on social media, and I love to come to the meetings, I, I think he's encouraging every culture and every faith, and, and that's one thing good. For example, um, if he encourages Muslims, to, to come out and, you know, speak up or exercise their faith. That's not a bad thing. It just shows, they, it, it kind of answers the question of what I was talking about earlier, where I said people are moving back to Somalia because they feel like, you know, they, they don't have things that, you know, the spies in their life, including exercising their faith. Um, of course they do, there's a mosque in the area and all of that, but somehow if the mayor um, shows them that, you know, that's great, we're doing that, and I'm the mayor of, of this city, um, it might actually make it easy for them to say, like, great, I'm enjoying living in this country, and I feel uh, that America is, you know, exactly the place where you can be free and, uh, um, and, and can, can exercise your faith. And honestly, Mayor, uh, Portland has given me the opportunity to, uh, to reconnect with myself. Um, I, I, as a child, you know, believing that I was American, I avoided going to the mosques. And my mother would chase me down the street. And I was pushed to do that, and I ran away from it because I was feeling she was taking something away from me. And when I came in Kenya, um, the Kenyan police wouldn't let us go to the mosque. And one day I almost died when this mob of uh, gangs, you know, chased everyone out of the mosque. And then I decided not to go to the mosque ever again. So technically, I could never peacefully exercise my faith until I came to Portland. And you can drive to the, you know, the, the parking lot at the mosque and, and do whatever you want to do in there and get out and nobody's pushing you or doing anything. And so that's a beautiful environment that, um, that needs to be, you know, to be done. But everything else that uh, she said about uh, women and all that, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for your statements. I appreciate that very much. Certainly, freedom of religion is very important in our city. Yes, please, over here. Um, I really appreciate what you said about being grateful. For Would you mind standing up? But I think it might be easier for people to hear. I appreciate what you said about being grateful for the safety and the freedom and just walking in a coffee. And so we have those freedoms, and we all should be more grateful. Um, another freedom that we have in, in the U.S. that I think um, people don't realize is everywhere is the freedom to pursue a different profession. You know, people were a banker and now they want to be a teacher, or they were a, you know, a teacher and now they want to be a doctor. And we don't realize that that's pretty amazing. We can zigzag and choose and reinvent ourselves. That's sort of an essential quality, I think, of being an American. You can reinvent yourself. Um, so if, if you have, you know, a couple hundred years, um, what are some of the professions you might like to reinvent yourself into? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> well, 200 years. There, there, people might be living on Mars, you know, who knows, and then there will be other, other things to do. Uh, but, but there's, I mean, there's so much. I'm now studying political science, which is a funny thing, and I might be getting into social studies, and I went to college in Kenya. I, I learned journalism because I believe that I'm a storyteller. And I know how to tell stories, and that was one point, you know, trying to get me do something. But when I came to America, I said goodbye to journalism because my stories are not going into the radios uh, anymore. And then I was like trying to invent myself again, thinking like, what's the one thing that you can do not only for America but for the world? And America has the readiness for that that it, it could it could give me. Thank you. Over here, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the golden ticket. Yep.
found in Britain and the United States? I have a green card now. And uh, uh, the way that I got my green card is through the diversity lottery. And I want to tell you this, um, the U.S., the uh, small amount number of refugees that the U.S. is bringing in, in actually not now, but they used to bring some uh, to the country, they, they had received um, some sort of assistance through trauma, counseling and all of that thing. But unfortunately, when I won the lottery, the U.S. government no longer considered me as a refugee. So I landed in Boston and I was on my own, except when this family actually had, uh, if, if I didn't know them, where would I leave? You know, how would I get all the money and all of that? Um, it takes five years for anybody from the time you get the green card to the time that you can apply for your citizenship. I totally understand that there might be some in the crowd tonight that have green card for 10 years and may not want to be Americans. But to me, I have nothing to lose. And this is what I need. If, if they could call me tomorrow for a interview to become a citizen, they would ask a few questions. Uh, who was the 45th president, or what, what are the three branches of the U.S. government, which I already feel like, you know, I'm ready for it. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, I can't vote. I still have a green card. So I, I, I'm part of the permanent residents in, in the U.S. Actually, there's almost millions of them right now. But then coming from Somalia with a ban, you know, under uh, what the, they upheld yesterday, um, it just freaks me out. So that's why I wish uh, it was almost five years now so that tomorrow I could go and, and apply for, uh, for the citizenship. But one more year to go. And then after that, I can bring my family. Uh, Hassan is my brother. Um, and uh, you heard this American life. And sadly, in this American life, he's in Kenya. Uh, and he's still in Kenya. He's married to a wife and has twins. Um, he got accepted to Canada. Hmm. The, US, the, US gov the U.S. denied him forever, and they said all, you know, you can't even try no more. Uh, but we got together, there's a Team Abdi, and now became Team Hassan, my brother's name, and it's, it's all, like eight people, including Sharon, and uh, we raised money, actually a lot of money, $28,000, and through sponsorship uh, 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 with the refugee agency, and now he's going to be in Toronto very soon. Yeah. Hey, uh, how are you? I'm good. Uh, we've known each other for what, a year now? No, so, so three years. Three years. <laughs> 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 a long time. So I have an observation and a quick question. Uh, you, you met a whole thing when you said that uh, refugees don't have identity, which I disagree with because I think uh, identity is not essential, therefore can you take it away. Mm -hmm. It's who you are, it's your personality. Um, and I uh, just just want to clarify that. And my question is, um, clearly you both um, right now men and women. Just stand up, just people can hear you a little better. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and you're in America. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of the brain gain and brain drain, mm -hmm. uh, which is what, what's happening in most cases, unfortunately. And um, I'm wondering how do you bridge that conflict? I know the American narrative is very enticing. Everybody wants to be high. Um, but if we keep um, indulging in this, I don't know how to, how to call it, maybe it's a, I don't know if it's a madness, because it's not really the, the most dramatic way of saying it, but uh, how do you reach that conflict? I mean, I know I have that internal conflict. I, I feel like the American narrative is very enticing and I want to belong to it, but at the same time, I have those strong ties at uh, home. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I've decided to go back at some point because I feel like that's the most honorable and noble thing to do. So how do you just, how are you very able to just quiet those voices inside you? Because I don't know that you have those. How do you just decide to leave all that behind and be like, I want to belong to the American right. America? Because I feel like Africa needs right. us. America will be just fine. I mean, right. Trump is just another episode. He's going to be fine to be Right, right. So how do we, because in the position that you are in right now, you have a voice, you can either tell the young kids, the young, uh, African young kids, hey, we have to go back. Do well, perform well, be excellent, that's good. But we have to go back and build our own nation. Mm -hmm. But how do you just manage to be like, yeah, let's go. The American narrative, it's, it's very good for this year. That's a good question. Bede J. Thank you. That's his name, Bede J. B D G. 
that's French. <laughs> um, uh, uh, when I say refugees don't have identity, um, actually there's a difference between refugee and immigrant. If you're an immigrant coming from Burundi, Rwanda, Congo, you have an identity, you have a government, you have peace. But you're, if you're coming from Somalia, where we lost everything, I'm talking about my generation that grew up in the civil war and had never, never seen a, anything that could get me connect to my country. Music was banned and it's gone and our musicians died or displaced from the country. So that's why I'm saying we lost our identity and when you come to Kenya, refugee is your identity, but it's also um, a status. It's not your joy. So people don't, I, I never said, well, call me a refugee. So I was kind of lost. That's why I'm saying we actually needed an identity until I came here and became a, a permanent resident. And this was, you know, I'm speaking for uh, majority of the refugees, but they could agree with me. And that's why I'm saying I got an identity when I got here. But the question uh, is, I would say, don't be scared. Get into it. Remember when I said, eat apple pie and steaks? <laughs> do, do you do uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas? Do you, do you rub gifts? <laughs> yes, it's, it's beautiful. Don't be scared of it. I mean, I know some people are so freaked out of that. No, I know I'm trying to answer the question. Exactly, I totally understand what you were trying to say. But the thing is, I'm saying just, I think that you said something like, how can I belong and then uh, still you know, have my heritage and everything behind me. So I'm saying if you really, the only word is like, don't melt. Melting is a problem. So you can be the salad. So if you melt, which actually means, now you speak uh, your native language. So melting actually means you won't be able to do that and you're gone. You know, you're, you're just an American and you're lost. Somehow, your identity is gone, so you will call yourself American. But if you really do everything that Americans do, if you become, you know, a book reader or a Star Wars fan, you know, this madness Americans do, that's America. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, you can still watch movies from your country and you can fly back, of course, as long as no one is going to shoot you and spend your summer. Oh, you're not going back? I can't go back. Well, I, I will go back if there's peace, but I can't go back because my country is completely not in the same situation as yours. We have madness, craziness going on. Coming from America can kill you. Well, I'll come the same. So you will to go back if things were done. Oh, hell yeah. I know these streets where I used to run around. I want to go back and revisit and be part of the construction. I thought you said that you never go back. Well, what I meant was, uh, I actually, did I say I will never go back? I don't think I said that. So what I'm trying to say, like right now, if you look at Somalia, the next 20 years, I'm not hopeful. I'm somehow pessimistic of how things um, are happening. But if miracle happens and we wake up tomorrow and everything is settled down and my mother calls me and she says, I'm walking all over the place, I'll definitely go. But now I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because I want to bring my family out, not really me, go join them. So which just shows you how pessimistic the situation looks to me. I got it. We got it. We're like, oh, I, I want to get one more, see if there's anybody else out there. Appreciate it. Um, is there anybody else who has a quick question? We got about one minute, so I want to just jump to it. So uh, somebody in the back sounded like they had theirs, and then we'll come in. Yep. Yes. Um, I'm a volunteer with um, Refugee and Immigration Services of Catholic Charities, and I just want people to know that on July 14th, that's a Saturday from 3 to 5 at Chevres High School. There is World Refugee Day celebration. And so as a way to support the refugees in our community and to get to know them and to eat some really wonderful food and hear some good music and some speakers, I would invite you all to come to Chevres on that, on that day. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that announcement. All right, we had a question, I think, up here, so I want to just give that opportunity. Yep, please stand up. Hi, Abby. I'm Sarah, and I, am, I teach English in Portland to immigrants. And I'm just intrigued by your story about how you learned English mostly by watching movies and by reading books. And I just wonder if that's the whole story or if you ever took any kind of structured English classes, if you had someone to practice with, and what the rest of the story is. I did not take any structured classes. The, the, f the first words that I learned from the movies were all swear words, the F word, the S word. <laughs> I thought everyone in the U.S. is well. I'll be back with those your first few words. <laughs>
yeah. one of them. So. I'll be back to Somalia someday. <laughs> Uh, but no, um, unless I came to Ken until I came to Kenya, and we went. I went to college for like a year, and that was so helpful to get me be able to get to know how to write better. Yeah. All right, we are going to have to wrap up. Um, I do want to. Uh, we're we're uh, Abdi's going to stick around. So if anybody wants to ask him a question, he'll he's happy to sign books. I really do hope all of you here buy a book if you haven't already. Uh, I want to thank Longfellow again for what they're doing and thank uh, the library. Rachel, is there anybody else that we need to be thanking besides? Any, anything you want to say to wrap it up? All right, so thank you. I, um, I, I really do want to, I want to thank Abdi. Uh, I want to thank Abdi for his courage because it takes a lot to write, to tell your own personal story, and to be willing to stand up in the way that you have. So thank you for all you've done and how you've helped Made America great.